Amen. All right, so uh, we're going to jump back into our uh, study. So we have spent a few weeks discussing um, cultural issues in regards to sexual sin. We've uh, we dealt with um, transgenderism, um, uh, homosexuality, um, adultery, fornication, and so I want to move this week into a new topic. What I was going to do originally, but I want to take today and I want to discuss abortion. I know it's a hot uh, topic, it uh, continues to be, um, and so I'm going to spend a little time on that this morning. Um, in 1973, of course, we had the, um, the famous Roe versus Wade decision where the government uh, essentially, the Supreme Court uh, legalized abortion, made it a federal right. Uh, it was, however, limited at um, the, the term viability, which was a very vague term. Um, uh, and I believe in the decision, they mentioned 28 weeks. Um, however, prior to that decision, one thing we do have to keep in mind is it wasn't so abortion was illegal prior to that. It was just regulated by states, and each state government could regulate however it saw fit. So, um, of course, some were far more uh, lenient and open to, to abortion than others. And, of course, this summer, a decision I honestly did not ever foresee happening, Or overturned that ruling. O versus Wade. Now, there has been, of course, some misunderstanding about that by some. Uh, uh, it did not overthrow abortion. Uh, it did not make it illegal. All right, I'm going because this one does not seem to be working. I'm sorry. Thought that might happen, so we had another one ready. Uh, but um, as I mentioned, uh, that did not outlaw abortion. It had nothing like that. All it did was simply say that it was a state's right and responsibility to regulate abortion. And so then, now since then, you've had some states um, that have outlawed abortion pretty much back to the time of six, around six weeks, six to 12 weeks. Some it's around 15. And then other states have even gone beyond the 28 marker to allow abortion almost up until the moment of birth. One state played around with the law of even after birth abortions. Um, um, and, and so that's all to say that overturning Roe versus Wade did not end the fight to the right of life. Uh, it did not end that fight. It actually has um, given us a playground for those who support life at conception, the, um, the ability to, um, to fight for that child's life uh, in our state. Um, I don't know North Carolina's rule on this, by the way. I should have looked that up. I just thought about that. Um, but, um, but it also makes it more complicated because each state has its own rules in regard to abortion. Um, I, I found this interesting just doing a uh, little research. Partial birth abortion. You all know what that means? What does it mean, partial birth abortion? Could. It really refers to that latter third trimester time period. Um, those who have had a child, you've seen those images on ultrasound. You've experienced what that child looks like. I mean, 
in the third trimester, uh, that child is for, fully formed. It's just a matter of growth at that point, from my understanding. Um, and partial birth abortions are when, in that third trimester, uh, they allow that opportunity to go in and, and, and kill that life. Um, those were not banned until 2003. Now, um, however, now with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, that playground has been opened back up. I believe it was New York and California are flirting with these afterbirth abortion uh, ideas. Uh, now, I don't, as far as I know, none of those have become legal, uh, but but it is something they're toying with. Um, some statistics about abortion uh, worldwide. Anybody have a guess at how many abortions are done worldwide each year? It's about 3.4 million a year around the world. Now, that's a world uh, estimation. In the U.S., um, best I could find, a little differing on the statistics is a about a little less than a million a year in the U.S. So you can see the U.S. is very prominent in the abortion practice. I also find it very interesting, Europe, uh, which for most of my life has seemed more uh, liberal in regard to its cultural practices. Actually, uh, many of the European countries are more restrictive than the U.S. Um, so I do find that very interesting. Um, around the world, it's estimated that there have been around 73 million abortions. Uh, so 73 children that were not able to take their first breath. Um, since 1973, it's been estimated that 63 million abortions have been performed in the U.S. So take that. So the rest of the world, so if you take the whole world in total, it's 73, 63 of those in the U.S. So the rest of the world has about 10 million. We have about 63 million. This is an American, prominent American issue, although other countries uh, participate as well. Um, and according to one statistic I found, 22% of pregnancies end in abortion, 22%. So... Uh, two out of every ten, approximately, uh, conceptions end in the ending of life. So, as Christians, however, we, we have some serious questions to, to ask ourselves, to, to look at the Word of God and determine for ourselves. And, of course, the first question would be, is abortion, um, the practice of abortion, is it okay with God? Now, um, we're going to take a few minutes and go through the scripture. Now, of course, that's a complicated question somewhat um, because abortions take place at different stages of pregnancy. And that's a question to ask. Does God care what stage it is? Um, is he okay with any of that? So we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, we'll probably hope to finish it today, but we'll see if we have to go into next week. So let's go ahead and go. Um, I know we've been there a lot. <laughs> We're going to continue to go back there. Genesis chapter 1. I have to start at the beginning uh, because there's so much in chapter 1 of Genesis. Chapter 2, 1 and 2. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. And somebody, if you don't mind, reading 26 through 28. And Gen God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. All right, so let's uh, let's break this down just a little bit again. Um, verse 26 and 27, what is it about those two verses that kind of stand out to you? 
Anything stick out? Anything don't jump yeah. off the page? Okay, man's made in God's image. Now, what's interesting about that is no other part of creation is ever stated like that. Um, also, well, I'll leave that alone. But so, man, man's creation is different than the rest of creation in that he has the stamp of God on him, on himself. That God has has made him in a likeness to God. No other creature, no other created thing is done in the same way. I think there's a depth to that that, that it's just so hard for us to grasp, but we continue to fish at it. Um, but so, so we note that in 26 and 27. Then 28, he, he's commanded to do a couple of things. What are they? Be fruitful, be fruitful okay, Number one, he says, be fruitful, multiply. That's a reference to what? The birth. Yeah, the continuation of the human species, of, of humankind. Um, uh, people, men and women are meant to marry and, and to have children. And so he set that in motion there at the very beginning. Um, you, and what's the second thing you note there? Again, dominion or subjection. What's that? Dominion or subjection. Yeah, that, that man has dominion over everything else. And later on, you, you kind of see this begin to play out when God tells Adam and Eve to do what with the garden? Till it. Yeah, to till it, to tend it, to care for it, right? Because you've been, get, been given dominion over it you, for it, you need to care for it. But it also says something about man being different than everything else. Again, he's setting man... Um, uh, above all the other created uh, things in our world. Um, and uh, if you go, we're going to bounce around just a little bit in Genesis for a moment, but go to chapter 9 and verse 6. Um, he, he makes an interesting statement. Uh, this is, of course, after the flood has occurred. Uh, this is kind of the restart of our world after after the flood and Noah and the family are, are going to come off the ark and they're going to begin to tend the earth again. They're going to begin to care for it. And along with some instructions God gives them, what's one of the things he says? Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. All right, so... Um, it's interesting, what is, this is in the midst of a discussion about why God now allows man to, to eat animals. He's not, uh, at least the scripture seems to indicate that he was not a, um, a, a meat eater prior to this. But after the flood is over, God allows him to eat animals. And, and one of the things he says, now the fear of man is going to be in animals. Like they're going to fear you which seems to indicate that prior to the flood, they didn't necessarily do that because we weren't killing them to eat them. However, and, and so thereby man would necessarily have to do what? He would have to shed the blood. He'd have to kill the animal. However, he, what does he say in regard to the killing of humankind? It's not, it's not acceptable in his... Mm -hmm. He says, you're not to shed man's blood because why? Made in the image of God. Made in the image of God. So he reflects back to Genesis chapter 1. Um, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, I want to note a couple of things here. Well, Genesis 3. I'll go to 2 in just a minute. If you go to Genesis chapter 3. It's 4. <laughs> if I can get it right. 4. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> After Cain has killed Abel, now if you remember earlier in the text, what did God tell prior to the incident there with this rock? What did God tell um, Cain after the sacrifices and his wasn't accepted? What did God say to... If you do well, will it not be accepted? What now? If you do well, will it not be accepted? 
Okay, he said that, yep. And then what did he go on to say? Sin lies at the door. Sin lies at the door. What's God trying to warn Cain about? He's vulnerable to sin. I mean, you know, he, it's there if you want. He's trying to warn him about the hate in his heart. Yep. And that's going to cause him to do something he shouldn't do. Um, and then, okay, so... If you go down to, so verse 8, he, he kills Abel. Mm-hmm. Then the Lord said to Cain, where, where, is your, uh, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood, and again, remember, Life is where? In the blood. I uh, said, you're not, Genesis 9, 6, you're not to shed man's blood. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, he's made in the image of God. He said, um, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. No. In that statement there about the ground is cursed, that's that's really speak should speak to Cain. Why? Because he'll go grow crops or nothing because it's not fertile no more. And he was a tiller of the ground, whereas Abel was a tender of sheep. And so that that was in particular should have hit Cain in a certain way that the ground is now cursed um, uh, because of you. Or it's cursed to you. All right, so you get in Genesis just this 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 idea that that murder, that the, the shedding of, of someone else's uh, life uh, of their blood is a big deal with God, yeah, we and that God, we can't take it. yeah, and it, and it's a deep crime yeah. with God. Um, Okay, now go to Genesis chapter 2. Another important thing to note, not just the blood, but even man's very breath. Genesis chapter 2, of course, details uh, a little bit more. It shows us a picture of the Garden of Eden and, and where it was prior to the flood. And then he talks about the, um, the forming of man and woman. And what does he say in verse 7? Nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, um, where did so he he forms man from the clay, right? He brings the clay together. Whatever God does, he he does that. He forms this body, but what's missing? The breath of life, God, um, and and so. Um, Adam just laying, Adam's body just laying there is what? Just clay. Just yeah, it it's just an earthly thing, but the actual act of God breathing into him, putting God's impression upon him, sets Adam apart. And, and he installs within Adam, Adam's body, Adam, right? He puts Adam in the body and he becomes a living being. Um, Zechariah chapter 12, the Zechariah the prophet says, Zechariah 12 and verse 1, the oracle of, of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed what? The spirit of man within him. And so who gives us our spirit? God does. God does. So God did that initially. And we also see God's attitude toward the ending of life prematurely by human hands. Well, but did God stop all of that with Adam? Key question. All right, so does God continue to be active in the formation 
of, of human beings. Well, let's, let's look, let's let the Bible speak on this. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Is God still active? Um, Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 5. What does Solomon say in regard to this, um, to this part of human existence, to the, to the coming of, of the soul? Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 5. Somebody read verse 5, please. Because you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. So you do not know the works of God who makes everything. All right, so what is Solomon saying in regard to, um, I know he's, he's speaking kind of in a general sense. And it's interesting, Jesus will 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 take that spirit part in John chapter 3, and he'll make a play on that with Nicodemus, talking about you don't know how the spirit works, you don't know how the wind moves. But here in Ecclesiastes 11, 5, what, what is Solomon saying to us? That there is a mystery, and he doesn't, he doesn't declare what it is, but he says there's a mystery in what? Way of this wind or spirit. And in the formation of mankind, he says that, um, he says, as you do not know the way uh, the spirit comes, into the, uh, comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child. And so he, he's indicating there's some activity that the spirit has in child conception, in the conception of, of our being. Um, we're going. Sorry, we're going to bounce around a little bit, but go to Job chapter ten. Job chapter ten. Job also has something to say about this. Um, what does what does the uh, uh, what does Job chapter ten verse eleven and twelve have to say? Clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews. You gave me life and showed me kindness, and in your providence watched over my spirit. So Job, in reflecting upon his own conception, his own birth, he says that what? God clothed me with skin and flesh. God did that how? In the initial um, creation of the birthing process, right? God gave gave man and woman the ability to, um, to germinate a zygote. That zygote would eventually divide and, and become a fetus, and that fetus would eventually uh, you know, become what we know as an infant. God's, God set all that in motion. But he also says that he has granted me what? Life and faith. Life. Can a husband and wife, can they grant life? They're a vessel to it. But they can't grant life. That's, that's God. That's the touch of God. Um, um, he says, you have, your care has preserved my spirit. Now one of, a verse that most of us probably maybe came to mind immediately was David in Psalm 139. This is a text that we will hear often in the discussion of, of conception and birth. What does David say in Psalm 139? Let's go there. Psalm 139, let's go to verse 13. We could read the whole chapter, but um, we're going to read 13 through 18. For you formed my inward part, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, substance being yet form, in form, unformed. And in your book they all are written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. There were but, none of them. If you'll read through 18. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, 
they would be more in number than the sand. When I am wake, when I wake, I am still with you. Uh, beautiful kind of poetic rendering here by uh, by David in regard to his own conception and. And, and God's tender touch upon us. Um, I think it's interesting here in verse 15, he says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was what? Being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. That depths of the earth, a poetic uh, illustration of, of, of secret mystery, mysterious things, right? These, these things take place in a mother's womb that are going on that we don't understand as, as, as good as we get maybe with ultrasounds and and our understanding of uh, of, of the physical body and, and science there's still elements to the whole conception process that we don't understand and i'm convinced we never will uh, because there is a spiritual element that must take place in all of these things there's a spiritual realm that touches the mother's womb at some point uh, that, that we don't understand. Uh, he says that, uh, for I am fearfully, verse 14, and wonderfully made. Uh, and he's, he's, he's talking about you know, his physical flesh and how God is a part of that. God is active in fetal development. Do I know exactly all the ways God touches that process? No, and I don't want to say I do, but I think the Word of God makes it evidently clear that God is a part of that and, and involved in that process. So number one, as we talk about this idea of ending life in the womb, we need to understand that we're, we're involving ourselves in something that that is a God process. We're stepping in the place of God and we're taking control of something that I believe we don't have the right to control. And, and so, um, so we need to keep that in mind. So uh, the next question, so is God involved? Absolutely. Do I know exactly how? No, I don't. But I know it's God that puts the spirit within man it's God that, that creates the, the soul, uh, the eternal part of us. So, when does life begin? Um, this is an interesting question, and not, not one that's super easy to answer, uh, but let's, let's take a few minutes and look at that. Um, in Genesis chapter 9, so if we go back to chapter 9, we read verse 6 earlier, but I want to back up and Begin at verse 4. Genesis 9 and verse 4. Again, this is after the flood is over. This is in a description of what man's existence will be like after the flood. You know, it's destroyed everything. It's rearranged everything. There's so much changed about the world. And one of the things now is man is going to need to eat meat. Whereas prior, it doesn't seem as though he did. And so, in the discussion of that, let's go to verse 4, and he directs toward, uh, toward humans. He says, verse 4, But you shall not eat flesh with its life. And he's talking about, of course, animals there. That is, its blood. So God, God forbids the eating of blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning from every beast I will require it, and from man. So, again, reiterating the idea that murder is, is, is sinful, it's evil. Um, and, and he makes a connection to blood here that's kind of interesting. Uh, um, he says, from his fellow man I will require reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds bl uh, the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And so God says that, um, that life is in the blood and that when blood is shed of mankind, uh, there, there has to be punishment involved. 
Now, um, in the development process, when does blood, when does it begin to, to appear? Anybody know? I mean, everything. But... So we, we begin to see blood cells as early as week five. So you're really early on in pregnancy. Um, and, and those blood cells begin to form. Um, What's, what's tricky about it is that the fetus has only been created for about two to three weeks at, at, um, at the point, um, at this point. So you probably know the process and, I, and I'm not a medical doctor or scientist on it, so I'll, I'll say that right up front. But my understanding is once you have fertilization, which takes place, uh, of course, there in the, uh, when the egg is released and sent down the fallopian tube and into the uterus. All right, so you have, you have the sperm that initiates uh, fertilization and, and fertilization begins to take place. And then I'm not sure how long, but then that egg has to attach to the uterine wall. And that takes a little bit of time Usually for that to occur. Huh? Usually six to eight weeks before it ever gets to the uterus. Yeah, so... So before it attaches, six to eight weeks. Um, so you, you already at that point uh, begin to have blood cells beginning to develop. Um, and, and so not in saying that, I'm not saying that it's at the point of blood cells that life begins. I'm not saying that. But I just want to note how early these processes begin to happen. Um, the heart begins to develop, I believe, about 12 weeks in. Um, you begin to have that early on movement there. And then, of course, after that, development begins to happen quickly. Um, But at what point in that process does God touch that, that process and then put life there? That's the key question. And you know what the answer is? I think it's from the very beginning. I do too, but we don't know, right? We don't know exactly at what point that is. So the point being there is any time we try to to put our touch on it and say, that's the point. We have, we're getting in the place of God. And so as, as human beings, without understanding and not being able to understand, what should our response be? We don't touch it. After fertilization, it's under God's control. And, and, and so... Um, I believe recently, and this is not uh, not definitive. I'm just giving it as an example. Most scientists who deal in this, I believe a poll was done recently, about 95% of scientists who deal with this believe life begins at conception because that's at the point things begin to happen. Um, and of course, again, there, there's parts of the process we don't understand but for us to step at any point and say, no, oh, that's not life yet. We have stepped in the place of God in there in determining what we think is best based on some arbitrary decision of humankind and, and, and trying to control a process that God controls. Yeah. Uh, and I had this argument this week, the morning after Peter or whatever they call it. it mm -hmm. That's still the same thing, is it not? You're, you are... You're, in my opinion, you're involving yourself. You're in taking it. something that could or could not be, but you're making the judgment to do it. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't get that across. <laughs> no, I, I I agree with that. I think that that's that you're. Why would you take the field in if the you place didn't think of God? Was there right. was my point. You know, why would you even take it if you didn't think you was? Yeah. 
So, um, and, and I want to, you know, there's some interesting things I, I want us to look at in regard to God knowing us before we're born. Uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Jeremiah the prophet says in regard to his own life, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and this is God speaking to Jeremiah. That's important to know. This isn't Jeremiah's opinion. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I, what? knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you, uh, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah says, before even the process began, God had already knew him. God already had designs for him. Um, now, what if Jeremiah's mom had said, no, nah, I'm not ready, and ended that? Well, can I can I wait till all that? <laughs> you can. And just a few minutes. Um, so, um, I'm just noting here. God had had established a a plan from the beginning. Um, so let's go to uh, Paul. Says something similar. Galatians chapter one and verse fifteen. Galatians one and uh, chapter one and verse fifteen. Paul said, Galatians 1, verse 15, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace. Again, the personhood of Paul, Paul notes it, that it was before he was born. And, um, and then I want to look at one more place here. Um, Luke chapter 1. So we hear from Jeremiah, we hear from Paul. Well, what about Jesus? Luke chapter 1, and begin at verse 39. Some of you probably already know where this is going. Luke chapter 1 and verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country. This is after uh, she's been told... By God, she's going to have a child that she's going to bear the Son of God. Um, she went to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth are the parents of John the Baptist or John the Immerser. Uh, and when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, what? The baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So you have John in the womb recognizing Jesus, indicating personhood of both babies uh, here in the womb. Um, so there is that recognition even there in the womb of both John of Jesus and the Holy Spirit of Jesus. Um, and, and so there is a recognition of, of the of the developmental process of a human being there inside the mother's womb. Now, why is this different than the pill? Well, what does the pill do? It's, it stops the fertilization process. And so I think that's the big difference there. No, you could, there's three ways that it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two, if they most of the time they don't ovulate. Number two, is it thickens the mucus 
is so um, that the sperm cannot travel through. And number three, it allows the um, the embryo not to stick to the wall. So most of the time, number one doesn't happen, but occasionally it can. Okay. So I mean, that's some everybody's going to have to deal with yeah. in their own heart. So let's go. So as we think about these things and move forward. So what you do note here is God is involved in the process. It is God's process. Mm -hmm. You also note that um, life um, uh, begins, those things begin very early on. And you also notice personhood recognized in the womb. Um, now, what is God doing in all of this? Well, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, there's an interesting question that comes to Jesus. And I want to talk about that as we end this part of our lesson. So we didn't get it all done. Um, got pretty close. All right, so Matthew 16, verse 26. Jesus says, "What for what profit will... Uh, Sorry, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? What's Jesus speaking about? Everybody worried to answer? What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the value of the human soul and how valuable it is what it should be toward us, our own soul. And also, he's speaking about the value of every human soul. And in an ending life, we have to ask ourselves, You're taking a soul. what are we doing in that process? Are we acting in the place of God? The murder of, innocent, um, of the innocent in the scriptures brings stiff penalty from God. Uh, real quickly, in the very limited time I have, um, there's a penalty in the Old Testament for killing or harming an unborn child. In Exodus 21, and I have to do these real quickly, but um, he, he points out the law in, regard, in regards to a woman who is pregnant. If two men are fighting or they get in some way and they harm that pregnant woman, and if she were to lose the child, what would be the result of that? Well, he said, um, but if there is harm, verse 23, Exodus 21, 23, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Isn't that interesting? He says that pregnancy, uh, that child ends, that's a life ending. And so you shall pay life for life. Um, in Exodus 23 and verse 7, keep far from false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And so finally, um, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. Proverbs 6 and 16, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination. So he gives a list of Seven things that, that, that God hates that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands, what? That shed innocent blood. Who are the most innocent among us? Those in our wombs. They're the most defenseless of all. You know, if we had a young child, an adult walked up to them and slapped them across the face, what would every one of us do? Would you get pretty angry about that? Why? Because it's, it, it's helpless compared to an adult. And yet, our country murders almost a million babies a year who can do nothing to defend themselves. Now, we could get very graphic in just talking about, I'm not going to, in talking about the process of abortion. You want to know that, go look it up. What these doctors do in going into these wombs and doing things like a DNC, 
I mean, you go and look at that thing. Your Dyson vacuum cleaner, if you have one, very expensive vacuum cleaner, has not, not anywhere nearly the suction power of that thing they suck a baby out with. We need to think about those things and about what we're doing. All right, tough talk. We'll move on to something different next week, uh, but I appreciate your time. We'll be dismissed and rejoined for worship in just a few minutes.